Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone to the Karst Waters Institute Frontiers in Karst Colloquium. Uh, in the next installment of our series on carbonate critical zone processes. Um, first of all, I just wanted to show you the entire schedule here for the spring semester. So we've already had one talk and then we have today's talk and we have one more coming up next month as well. Um, and I wanted to note that these talks are also available on um, the Karst Waters Institute website, including the talks from last fall, which you see here. So if any of these looks interesting to you and you weren't able to make it, uh, be sure to go check that out on the Karst Waters, karstwaters.org. Um, you can find the links to the YouTube recordings of, um, of these videos. Okay, so today, we're excited to invite Dr. Richard Ott from GFC Potsdam to, to give our presentation. Richard did his undergrad at uh, Tübingen and then continued on to a master's at Tübingen where he also spent part of his time at Arizona State University. And then he went on to a PhD at ETH Zurich and uh, currently, he's a Swiss National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellow, fellow at Potsdam. And in both his PhD work and his postdoc work, he's been doing some things that are, that are quite interesting, I think, for the, the carbonate community. So I'm excited to, to hear about what he's been working on. With that, yes. we'll hand it over to Richard. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for the introduction. I'll start sharing my screen. And I hope you guys can now see my presentation. Is that correct? Yeah, we, we can see it. All right, cool. Yeah, well, thanks. I'm really excited to give that talk today um, because usually I'm more of a tectonic geomorphologist. And so I'm excited to show this work to the carbon uh, cast community and get some feedback from maybe a little bit different angle. And so today I'll be talking about um, mechanical versus chemical denudation in Mediterranean carbonate landscapes, and also about uh, global scale effects of carbonates on biodiversity and vegetation density and like other biological parameters. And I'd just like to acknowledge um, the rather long list of people that have contributed to this work uh, over the years. And so the first part of this talk, I'll be mainly trying to address why often in the Mediterranean uh, region, you have carbonate mountains that seem to be quite high and steep. This is a picture that's been taken from NASA in the 1970s. And I've annotated here um, this fault line that's offshore and that's uplifting the coastline of the island here. And we have about a constant uplift rate here. Uh, which we know from marine terraces. And when we look at the topography here along the coastline, we have this mountain range here that's about a thousand meter high. Um, however, when we move along the coastline, we get into this really high mountain range that's two and a half kilometer elevation. And when we look at the geology, the difference between these two regions is that here on the left-hand side, we are in metamorphic bedrock, whereas here, um, we have a carbonate mountain range, which is just um, substantially higher uh, than this mountain, other mountain range. And that's an observation you can do everywhere on this island of Crete in Greece. Um, this here is a plot of hypsometry for different um, lithologic units. So we have here elevation versus the cumulative frequency of this lithology. And you can see that the carbonates here in blue are substantially higher than all other rock units on the island. And that despite having the same tectonic uplift rate. So that means that for some reason, uh, there must be a difference in erosional behavior between these different rock units. And that makes these carbonate mountains here really steep and high compared to the other rock units. Just to give you uh, some overview of how these landscapes look like, 
This is uh, the gorge, uh, the Samaria Gorge in the mountain range that I've just shown you from space. Um, and here on the left hand side, you have another picture of um, one of these mountain ranges on the top with a patchy soils and few vegetation. Whereas here on the right, uh, you see the landscape in one of these metamorphic uh, rock mountain ranges with rather rolling hill topography. And then, so in the first part, we'll talk about um, what are the differences in erosional behavior between such, such carbonate uh, regions and other rock types. And we'll mainly be talking uh, about quantifying chemical versus mechanical denudation in these landscapes. And then we will try to um, uh, assess how do these erosional differences actually lead to differences in carbonate topography compared to other uh, mountain ranges. And then in the second part, this is also a bit motivated by observations on the island of Crete. Uh, we'll be talking about what effect carbonates can have on biologic parameters like the vegetation or the biodiversity of animals. And we'll try to quantify that on a global scale, but I just wanted to show you two motivational pictures here from Crete, uh, where you can see um, on the left-hand side, um, again, one of these high carbonate plateaus uh, that barely has any soils and barely has any vegetation. Uh, this is a picture taken at lower elevation where you can see on the left-hand side, we have silt and mulch cropping out and we have rather dense vegetation. Whereas on the right-hand side, we have carbonate bedrock and much less vegetation. So we'll be trying to see if we can see such effects actually on a global scale. So coming, to back, coming back to part one, what might difference in, differences in erosional behavior be? So one obvious uh, thing that's different in carbonates compared to other rock types is the elevated role of chemical weathering in these landscapes. And so I'll be trying to quantify what is the partitioning between chemical and mechanical denudation in carbonate catchments. And then the second part um, is um, what, um, the second thing that's different in carbonates is the hydrology forming a cast water system, having a lot of infiltration of surface water to the groundwater system. And we'll be asking like, what are the effects of this infiltration on topography? And we'll be looking at this first um, by um, examining data from Crete that we collected there, then um, compiling data from locations around the Mediterranean. And then in the end, I'll try to come up with a general model. So how do we quantify uh, denudation in carbonate landscapes? Well, chemical weathering is rather straightforward to, um, um, to calculate. You basically need the ion concentration in your water, and you need to know how much runoff do you have, uh, which then allows you to calculate how much weathering you had um, in total. However, uh, the mechanical part is much more challenging, especially on the landscape scale. And what we'll be using in this talk is um, cosmogenic radionuclides as a method to quantify total denudation in the landscape. And then we'll make the assumption that since we know total denudation and chemical weathering, the difference between the two should be our component of mechanical erosion in these landscapes. So what are cosmogenic radionuclides and how do they help us here? Um, the Earth gets constantly bombarded by cosmic rays coming from the sun, and these interact with Earth's atmosphere, and they interact with material close to or just below Earth's surface. And material that is in this region close to Earth's surface uh, will accumulate cosmogenic radionuclides over time. And these are usually um, nuclides that are only being produced by interaction with these cosmic rays and don't naturally occur. And examples of this that we'll be using here are chlorine 36 and beryllium 10. And so the longer material is being exposed to these cosmic rays and is sitting close to the Earth's surface, the higher its concentration of these cosmogenic radionuclides will be. You can imagine this as kind of a sun tanning 
of material that is close to the Earth's surface. And from that, you can use this method um, also to um, deduce denudation rates within a landscape. The idea being that if you are in a fast denudating or eroding landscape, your material um, will spend less time close to the Earth's surface, for instance, in the soil, and will therefore have less time to accumulate these cosmogenic radionuclides. And if you're in a uh, rather slowly eroding landscape, a grain released from bedrock, for instance, will sit a long time in the soil, will give it a lot of time to accumulate these cosmogenic radionuclides, and will therefore have a higher concentration of them. And so the way we do this for uh, a landscape scale is that we go to a river catchment and we go to the outlet of the river, which would be here, and we collect a sample of alluvial sand of this river. The idea being that if we collect a sand or pebble sample, that we have a lot of different grains and pebbles that came from different regions in this catchment, and that they should, if we measure the total, concentration within, uh, within our sample, this should be a, a good average of the concentration of material close to the Earth's surface within our catchment. And this should allow us to um, calculate a average denudation rate for our catchment. And so that's what we've been doing um, on Crete. We collected um, chlorine 36 samples in carbonate catchments. And for comparison, we collected beryllium 10 samples in metamorphic rock catchments. And we also collected water chemistry um, samples and data to assess chemical weathering rates. And the way we um, calculated carbonate dissolution rates was by uh, taking water samples and measuring the ion concentrations, doing a precipitation correction for um, ion input from, for instance, the sea, then um, looking at time series of um, calcium and magnesium um, concentrations over time to see how much variation we have. And then once we um, know our concentration site, we um, looked at um, precipitation and evapotranspiration in our uh, catchments to um, assess how much runoff we have. And then we have the concentration, we know the runoff, we can, from that, calculate a carbonate dissolution rate for our regions. And this is how the data look like. I am plotting here on the y-axis the denudation rate, and here um, local relief measured within a 500 meter radius and averaged for our catchments. And in blue, I'm showing you the chemical weathering rates we got from our water samples. So you can see that basically no matter how steep the catchment, we get always about the same uh, chemical weathering rate of 0.04 millimeter per year. But when we look at the uh, red triangles, these are the total denudation rates we got from our cosmogenic radionuclides. Um, they're first of all, quite a bit higher than our chemical weathering rates. And they also seem to increase with increasing local relief. Now, this increase with um, steepness of the topography um, is already suggesting um, that there are mechanical, uh, that there is mechanical erosion going on here because mechanical erosion is a slope dependent process. And also we have the denudation rates being uh, substantially higher than the chemical weathering rates. And we attribute the difference between the two uh, should be mechanical erosion going on in these catchments. And if you take an average that comes down to being about 60% of denudation in these carbonate catchments from mechanical erosion. Now I'm plotting on here uh, with the black dots, the beryllium 10 denudation rates we measured in the metamorphic bedrocks uh, catchments. And you can see that these uh, have very similar denudation rates compared to our carbonate regions. And so it is interesting to see um, again, as I said in the beginning, these metamorphic rock um, mountain ranges have the same uplift rate than our carbonate mountain ranges. You can also see that also the denudation rates are rather similar, despite the topography being so um, drastically different. 
And in the um, metamorphic rock catchments, we found mechanical erosion to be more than 90% of the total denudation as you would expect. So their chemical layering is less important. Now, if we zoom out a little bit and we try to do that on a larger scale, um, these um, chlorine 36 denudation rate measurements for um, whole catchments have only been done in two other regions. And one of them being uh, several studies in Israel. And then we've got a bunch of studies in Southern France. And what we did is we compiled uh, the rates from these different regions. And also for there, we calculated carbonate dissolution rates, again, from um, water chemistry measurements. And this is how the data look like. Uh, here on the y-axis, again, we have denudation rate uh, plotted against local relief of a catchment and here against local slope. And I'm showing you again the total denudation rates measured from chlorine 36. So you can see that again with increasing steepness of the topography, we can see an increase in total denudation rates. Again, indicative of mechanical erosion in these landscapes. And this is how the chemical weathering uh, rates look like that we calculate for the same regions. Um, can see that um, the rates are again, as for Crete, quite a bit lower than the total denudation rates with the difference that should correspond to mechanical weathering. And you can see that this difference increases with increasing steepness of the topography. Now, now that we've established that in these um, regions that we've looked at around the Mediterranean, we have a lot of um, mechanical erosion. How does this in the end actually lead to this um, drastic difference in topography that I've shown you in the first um, satellite picture? And for that, I wanna show you a very simple um, 1D numerical model of a uh, simplified mountain range. And I'm modeling basically two river profiles that meet in the middle at the drainage divide, showing you um, basically a simplified mountain range here. And in the elevation of such a river profile, if you want to compute it, the change of elevation of this will be the uplift rate minus the erosion rate. So the difference between the two will be the change of the stream bed over time. Now, if we have a steady state condition, and that's what we're going to try to model here, uh, this difference should be zero and uplift should equal erosion. This is what rivers usually strive for. They try to incise or erode as fast as uh, the uplift rate. Now, if we uh, wanna model only a mechanical erosion, so kind of a reference case for these um, metamorphic rock um, mountain ranges, where well, we can use the stream power incision model to do that. And in that case, we model erosion as a, the bedrock erodibility K times the discharge of the river times the local slope. And these two go by two um, empirical constants, which are not uh, so important for this um, simplified case here. And now if we have this um, standard model and we um, integrate chemical weathering into this to see how the landscape would change, this is kind of what we would predict. Uh, this green line that you see here in the graph. So you see a topography that is lower compared to the first case uh, where we only had mechanical erosion. And the reason is that now in this case, we balance the uplift field by erosion plus chemical weathering. So we have the sum that can counteract this erosion uh, uplift rate. And because we have chemical weathering here, we do need to do less erosional work and because erosion is slope dependent, we do less erosional work. We don't need as much as a slope that uh, of the slope in the landscape. And that's why in this case, the mountain range would be um, less steep. Now the opposite, um, oh, sorry. Uh, this is just uh, to show you how we would, how we calculate chemical weathering in this case. Uh, we actually scale the equilibrium constants, temperature, and elevation basically. And we also scale uh, PCO2 and runoff with elevation. But 
Um, the exact values are really not that important for now. The essence just being that um, chemical weathering would um, lead to a less steep topography. Now, the opposite would occur if we have um, infiltration mimicking a cast water system where we lose surface water to the groundwater system. And on Crete, we have some water budgets that um, allow us to assess that we have a loss of about 70% of the surface water uh, to the groundwater system. And we can see that infiltration would um, steepen such a profile uh, of rivers in the mountain range quite dramatically. And if you want to understand why that is the case, we have to look at uh, this equation again. Um, in this case, we're modifying uh, the erosion of the river because erosion, going back to that stream power law, we have the discharge and the slope coming in here. And what we do when we have infiltration into the groundwater system is that we basically decrease the discharge in our streams and therefore uh, the streams need to steepen and therefore the whole landscape needs to steepen in response to this loss of surface water. And that is why uh, in such a case, you would steepen the topography uh, quite substantially compared to a normal mechanical erosion case. And now we can again go back and look at a picture that I've shown you before, because now we know that these two mountain ranges here are basically uh, denudating at the same rate. Um, however, here in this mountain range, um, we still need to do a lot of mechanical erosion work despite it being carbonates. And we have a lot of infiltration and this um, leads to a quite dramatic steepening of the landscape to do the same amount of erosional work. And you can even take this one step further and try to then argue for a basically a more general model of carbonate topography. And this plot might be a bit confusing in the beginning and I'll try my, try my very best to walk you through it. Um, so on the x-axis, we have the total denudation rate within the landscape, which will be somewhat also set simply by the tectonic uplift rates. And then we have here on the y-axis, the ratio of mechanical to chemical denudation in a landscape. So everything that is below this uh, one line here will be dominated by uh, chemical weathering, whereas everything that is above this one line will be dominated by mechanical weathering, uh, mechanical erosion, sorry. So if we um, think back, uh, to the values that I've shown you from Crete, the data that we have from there. Uh, in kind of the lower relief catchments that we had on Crete, where denudation rates were low, so we would be somewhere in this region, we had about a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio of mechanical to chemical denudation. So we would plot somewhere around here. However, in the steeper areas on Crete, we had quite a higher denudation rate and this was mostly, mostly accommodated by having more mechanical erosion. So for the same kind of climate, like being for instance on Crete, you would move along one of these gray lines and move towards uh, a higher ratio of mechanical to chemical denudation um, within the same landscape, if you increase your denudation rate. Um, so yeah, something like the scorcher that I've been showing you in the beginning would plot somewhere around here on this plot being dominated by mechanical erosion. However, you could also imagine a different climate setting, um, for instance, being somewhere in Southern Ireland or so, where you have a low um, uplift rate and a low denudation rate, um, where everything that you, all the denudational work uh, that's occurring in your landscape can be done by um, chemical weathering. And so you would plot somewhere down here in the region on this plot. However, even though, even in such a kind of um, landscape favorable for chemical weathering, if you would increase your denudation rate over a certain threshold, um, you would need to do more mechanical erosion work and you would need to steepen your landscape again. A landscape down here 
in this chemically dominated part doesn't need to be um, doesn't need to form um, steep slopes simply because chemical weathering um, doesn't require this and only mechanical erosion um, needs the slopes to um, basically accommodate the mechanical erosion work and so this is model is basically um, a general idea of how to um, predict that sometimes in certain climates cal carbonates will form this um, low subdued topography uh, whereas in other kind of regions carbonates will be sticking out and be very steep and this is very similar to ideas that have been put forward by since 2004 just now um, basically in a slightly different framework and basically backed up by our um, um, chemical versus um, mechanical denudation rate data and so in the second part of this talk i wanted to talk about an observation that many um, um, people that go out into the field and especially those that are interested in uh, carbonate areas have often made and it's about how carbonates can change um, the biology and different biologic parameters in the landscape and this has been um, described very early on as a nice paper from Unger in 1836 where he describes how carbonates in the Alps uh, have very different vegetation types and often less vegetation compared to um, other bedrocks that he was finding in the Austrian Alps. And so what I was trying to do in the study is basically see, can we observe this signal on a global scale? And also does this signal um, go past um, vegetation and affect animals on a, on a larger scale? So what I've been doing is, um, I took a, the global lithologic map that you can see in the picture down here. And you can see um, carbonates uh, are blue in this map. And I only um, analyzed areas that were um, hilly or mountainous in topography, um, trying, basically trying to avoid flat sedimentary basins where the bedrock, for instance, uh, of a region wouldn't have much of an effect on uh, what's going on at the surface. And what I've been doing is then looking at the effect of topography uh, of lithology on topographic and biologic variables. And topographic ones I've been looking at were elevation, relief, slope, or the channel steepness of rivers. And the biological ones were the vegetation density within the region, um, basically derived from um, satellite um, measured vegetation indices. Uh, here I'm using NDVI, so the normalized difference vegetation index, or the biodiversity of tetrapods and amphibians. I'm using amphibians like as a special group because um, they need water for reproduction and therefore might be sensitive to the um, hydrological conditions within the region. Now, if you want to find the lithologic effect on biologic parameters, uh, the main problem is that uh, vegetation density, biodiversity, all these parameters will be mainly controlled by climate. So there's a really strong correlation of temperature and precipitation for these things. And to find a potential effect of other variables like lithology, then you, you need really to take into account these differences in temperature and precipitation. And there are different ways that I've been doing this in the study. Uh, one of them was by binning different temperature precipitation conditions and only comparing data for the same kind of climatic uh, conditions. The other uh, method was uh, to use several multiple linear uh, regression models. But my favorite um, model that I've been using in the end is a generalized additive model. Uh, which is basically fitting a flexible response to predict the variables. And you can see an example of this here on the right hand side, this plot. So here I'm plotting precipitation versus temperature, and I'm using as a variable the NDVI data. So I'm looking at how do the NDVI data change with temperature and precipitation. 
And what this um, generalized additive model does, it fits a 2D surface through these NDVI data. And you can see here the contour lines of this 2D surface. And you can see high values up here for high precipitation and temperature uh, rates, which makes sense. So a humid and warm climate will have a higher NDVI, meaning vegetation density. And you see these negative values down here. So a cold and dry area will have a lower vegetation density. And so I use these, uh, these regression models to um, basically remove the effect of climate. And then I analyze the residuals uh, from these regression models to search for an effect of lithology. And this is how the data look like. Uh, this is now for three different um, biological variables. You have on the left-hand side, NDVI, so the vegetation density index kind of, uh, we have the tetrapod richness, so the number of tetrapod species, and we have amphibian richness, so the amphibian uh, number of species within the region. And I'm showing you um, down here the different, um, this is the legend for the different rock units that I've been looking at. And I'm using in this uh, study carbonate as a reference, uh, reference level. So carbonates will be this zero dashed line and everything that's above carbonates will, be, will have a higher value of NDVI or a higher number of uh, species. And everything that's below will be um, lower compared to carbonates. And so if we look on the left-hand plot for NDVI, we can see that basically all rock types uh, that I've analyzed here had higher values of NDVI compared to the carbonate reference level. And we see a similar picture when it comes to the number of tetrapod species, and also when it comes to the amphibians, though for the amphibians, we also have volcanic rocks and mixed carbonate rocks that exhibited low number of amphibian species. And so in conclusion, you can say that carbonates seem to have a lower vegetation density and richness of tetrapod and amphibian species. Now, that what I've shown you just is just a correlation and it doesn't necessarily mean causation, but I think there are uh, valid reasons to think that um, this is actual a causative effect of carbonates uh, that they have on biology. And one of them being that um, often carbonate regions have a lower nutrient content of um, growth limiting elements like uh, phosphorus compared to other regions. And I think even more importantly, um, in carbonate regions, often you have a lower water availability um, simply due to infiltration to the karst water system um, and, for instance, a lower clay cant content of some weathering products, which leads to problems for um, uh, water supply to the plants. And these effects have been demonstrated in several local vegetation studies, but here um, I can show it for a kind of global scale analysis. And vegetation um, being the primary food source for local fauna, uh, that could be then the explanation of why we see this effect also for the richness of tetrapod species. And for amphibians, it, there might be um, the problem of um, needing water for reproduction and therefore being sensitive to carbonate regions often being uh, drier than other regions. And so to sum up, um, Cosmogenic and uh, chlorine 36 seems to be a promising tool to um, quantify mechanical denudation in carbonate landscapes if we combine it with um, measurements of chemical layering. However, um, I want to send out a disclaimer here so that, um, that you have to be careful um, to use this method in regions that are likely drier and where weathering isn't the um, dominant process and not just everything weathers away because um, some of these um, assumptions that you're making here uh, might be problematic in a landscape where you have only weathering. But otherwise, it seems to be a promising tool uh, in this regard. 
and in the Mediterranean carbonate um, landscapes, um, we found that um, all of them that we looked at were dominated by mechanical erosion. And it seems like the combination of um, this um, mechanical erosion happening in these landscapes and the high rates of infiltration that lead to the mountains, they're often being very high and steep, Com especially when compared to other rock types. And looking at um, biological parameters, um, I could hopefully show you that um, vegetation density and animal biodiversity in carbonate re areas is lower on a global scale, which might be um, related to um, especially a lower water availability in these regions. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. All right, thanks Richard for the really thought provoking talk. Um, those of you who have questions, you can enter them into the chat. Uh, and if we need some clarification, we might have you um, actually talk to us. Um, while, while you guys are doing that, I'll go ahead and get us started with a first question. Um, I've got a lot of questions, but um, may, maybe just the, the first one sort of on the methodology. So for this yeah. uh, 36 chlorine, um, what, what sort of samples are you taking? So for beryllium, you need quartz, if I understand correctly. But with yeah. this, are you actually taking carbonate sands or, or is it still quartz? Is, what, what, when you take a sample, what does that process look like? Yeah, you, you're still, t you're taking um, carbonate. You're basically, calcite is your target mineral. For beryllium 10, usually quartz is your target mineral. Here in this case, calcite is your target mineral. And then you have to make a decision about um, your grain size that you're using. And I think there is some, there's some interesting um, discussion that we could have about what grain size might bias certain measurements. It's probably best to take a rather um, large uh, variation within your grain size and not just stick to a, a certain grain size. But yeah, you, you take uh, basically carbonate sand, carbonate pebbles, and you dissolve those to measure the chlorine 36 in your sample. Okay. Let's see, I don't see another question yet, so. Uh, here's one. Ah, okay. Okay, um, here's a question from the chat. Uh, have you thought about soil thickness in carbonate landscapes and how that might limit the vegetation growth and animal biodiversity? Yeah, um, I didn't like specifically look at soil thickness for this study, but I think um, that's basically plain like that is basically um, what I'm trying to argue too, because soil thickness is then also very much related to vegetation uh, on the surface. So if you basically can't grow much and don't have much vegetation, you will have um, more problems uh, forming a good soil to grow stuff on. So I guess there's a kind of a feedback there. And yeah, as I said, I think one problem is simply that the weathering products then in these carbonate landscapes just don't form a, a good soil basically to grow things on. And it looks like we have a uh, follow up to that. Um, the hand yeah, up, do you go mind? ahead and unmute yourself, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That'll be much easier than, than uh, putting them in the chat. Yeah, this yeah, is a very ahead. interesting talk, Richard. I really appreciate that. Um, a follow up on the soil thickness. Um, have you studied the landscape uh, in terms of soil thickness, but also soil chemistry? Because you are looking at you know mechanical versus chemical denudation. In that sense, you know if you have a, a mechanical uh, rodent dominated system, then the cell thickness will be really different, right? And the cell chemistry will be different. So have you uh, worked on the soil itself? Um, no, not at all. Like, um, I must admit the, the two parts were um, a bit um, separated in that talk. I, th I think that's a very interesting th thought though. But um, for the second study, um, all I did is basically take the bedrock type 
and see if there's a correlation with these biological variables. I didn't go through the soil, which would be kind of the mediator between the two, but um, that would be definitely something interesting to look at. The, the viewer chemistry uh, you, you reported here, have you looked at the, um, the saturation indexes for calcite, for example? Is the system at equilibrium? That means because you use, I think you use the word chemostat in one of your slides. Does that mean the system is already at equilibrium by the time the river uh, drain out of the uh, watershed? Yeah, so we, we have different kind of um, measurements and different measurement locations. We had some spring waters, we had some rivers, and we had, um, uh, what else do we have? Yeah, I think, yeah, well waters. And yeah, this, we have looked at the situation in the seas and that um, depended really. Um, we had often slightly undersaturated or at equilibrium um, spring and well water. And uh, for the rivers, um, we had some that were in equilibrium, but also a uh, super saturation. Um, so yeah, we, we have looked at that. So that means this, the chemical weathering is really limited by uh, your water, how much, how much water is flashing out of the system. Um, yeah, we also, as I said, we also had a few um, that were undersaturated that seemed to be also limited by the uh, amount of CO2. So it, it kind of depended on, on, what, on what region we were looking at and where the water was sourced from. And yeah, we sometimes it seemed to be limited by water and sometimes it seemed to be limited by CO2. Um, I don't recall a general pattern there. All right, thank you so much, Richard. That was very interesting. Thanks. I'll ask maybe sort of a follow-up to that. So, <clears throat> Have you thought much about the interaction between the chemical and the mechanical processes? So certainly mechanical processes are going to speed up chemical weathering by increasing, increasing surface area. Like if, if you produce a bunch of um, carbonate particles, then those are going to weather chemically much more rapidly. So um, I'm just curious what, what your thoughts are on the, on the interactions of these two types of processes within the landscape. Yeah, that's, that's actually actually a very interesting thought. And I think you um, might have a point there. And going back to, um, oh, damn it, now I clicked away the presentation. <laughs> oh, anyway, I'll, I'll try to explain to you. Like um, when we, um, when I showed these plots where we had the total denudation rate um, and also the chemical weathering rates for my total data set, the chemical weathering rates also seem to increase and uh, when we had more um, total denudation in the system, which could be on the one hand, rather likely be related to the effect of uh, steeper and how higher mountain ranges having a higher water flux because they have more orographic precipitation. But it could also the fact that you mentioning could play in there that if you basically have more mechanical erosion and create more particles, you have more surface area for weathering but yeah, I haven't looked into it enough to be able to differentiate, but it's a very interesting thought. Yeah, I was partly thinking about observations in streams around where I live, where the carbonates seem to not last very long. You basically end up with all the sediment in the stream is, um, you know, the, the sandstones or the chert that are inside the limestone and the carbonates basically gone. Um, so it, it seems in a lot of landscapes, the, the chemical weathering may remove the mechanically weathered components of the carbonates before they really get very far in the streams. Yeah, though so in those landscapes that we've been um, looking at around the Mediterranean, uh, it really seems that um, a lot of this carbonate material makes it out of the catchment really in a mechanical form. So you really, you have, for instance, fans at the outlet. Okay. That may be related to the fact that it's more air. It's, it's pretty humid exactly. where I live. So, yeah. <clears throat> okay. It looks like. Yeah. 
We have another question in the chat and I'd, I'd actually, I'd like to elaborate upon John's question a little bit because I've been thinking about this too. So you presented your uh, general model that you're working off of where total denudation is equal to the mechanical erosion plus carbonate weathering. Um, but I was thinking there, you know, there are more processes wrapped up into that total denudation. And so one that um, John is asking about here is, uh, have you considered weathering by acids other than carbonic acid? Um, and he states sulfuric may be the most important, but nitric in managed cultural, uh, agricultural areas could also be important. Yeah, um, for this study, we haven't looked into that. Um, um, I think it's definitely a, a important point in some regions. Um, however, we, when we looked at our water data, um, it seemed like the only really important acids here for our weathering um, was um, carbonic acid, and that's why we only looked at that. But I'm sure that for certain regions, um, this might be very different where you should definitely, uh, when you, I mean, this weathering by sulfuric acids or humic acids would still play, I would still count that into that chemical weathering uh, box. It's just that in our landscapes, we didn't find any uh, indication of that being important. And therefore we only looked at carbonate um, weathering through carbonic acid. Um, I had another question actually pertaining to your uh, diversity yes. modeling. So looking at, at biodiversity um, and you looked at what tetrapods and um, amphibians, um, what's the other? amphibians, I was blanking on the, the I lost my nouns. Um, so I was wondering, those are both uh, just terrestrial species that you're looking at, or are you also accounting for uh, subterranean biodiversity, which really might uh, change how your signal shows up in carbonates? That's a very good question. And actually, um, I'm not sure. I'm, I don't know the answer to that. What, um, like I'm, I'm using, basically data compilations by biologists, but I haven't looked into if they would include these subterranean species in it. Um, that's something, that's a very good point and I should definitely look that up. Yeah, I actually had basically the same question, which is how much of that diversity is being diverted into the subsurface. There, there are quite a few studies on subterranean biodiversity and trying to understand what controls that. Um, I'm not an ecologist, but I've seen, seen people give talks on this. So, so it might be interesting to, to delve into that literature and see what, what people say about subterranean biodiversity. Yes, that's a very good point. My guess is that it probably doesn't offset the, the loss of surface biodiversity, but um, might be interesting to look at. Other questions? I could keep asking questions, but <laughs> don't want to dominate. I guess I'll, I'll ask another question since we're, since we're waiting here. So um, thinking about chemical versus mechanical erosion. So you showed this, this nice plot where you were, you were plotting, what was it, denudation rate versus the ratio of chemical and mechanical erosion. And, and I think this kind of encompasses the way I was thinking about it, but uh, I'll, I'll try I'll, to pull it up one more time. Okay, yeah. Um, I had a couple of questions related to that, so maybe it makes sense to, to show that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the way I was, I was sort of thinking about it myself was how much chemical versus mechanical erosion you get would depend on your ratio of uplift rate to, um, to your chemical denudation rate. So your chemical denudation rate is basically controlled by climate. It's sort of mm -hmm. a constant. And you could look at a ratio of that to your uplift rate and sort of predict where you might expect chemical or mechanical erosion to be dominant. I think exactly. that's sort of hidden in this, but it's maybe just different axes to, to express the same idea. Yeah, I guess you could, in your way of thinking, replace total denudation rate simply by total uplift rate. And that would be the same kind of thinking. 
Okay. Yes. Yeah, so the other thing I wondered about on this is is your your lines that are on there and this break in slope. Could you maybe just explain? Uh, is the idea with these lines that you're just cranking up um, total denudation, and and yes, if so, why why is it, why is there this steepening? Yeah. The the idea is basically exactly like you said. You um, as you crank up total denudation, you uh, do more mechanical erosion work, and then. The idea simply being that at some point um, you've maxed out what you can do by chemical weathering. And there might be many different feedback processes that lead to this, but um, then once you've basically uh, hit that point where you cannot do more chemical weathering work, you only can increase denudation by mechanical erosion and therefore uh, the line gets steeper. That's the idea. Okay, so it looks like we've got another question here from Mitya. So do you have an idea about the ratio between chemical and mechanical denudation rate in colder climates with less precipitation? Um, cold climates and less precipitation. So um, I don't have a general idea, my, my sense would be that, well, if you have less precipitation, then you um, would have less chemical weathering simply because you, you're kind of missing the, the runoff. And maybe also in your cold climate, you will have uh, less vegetation supplying you with um, acids to do the um, chemical weathering work. So I would assume that you would have a substantial amount of um, mechanical erosion in such a landscape. Um, but we haven't looked at any data from such a region. Uh, there's something I was wondering about. Um, in your uh, two stream uh, landscape evolution modeling that you are mm -hmm. doing, um, you're assuming a steady state. Yes topography for you do where you do this. So is your study area in the Mediterranean at steady state? Um, that's a good question. And probably um, parts of it, yes, and other parts of it, no. And um, I would argue that for instance, these uh, metamorphic rock uh, mountain ranges that I've shown you, those are probably close to a steady state, but the carbonates probably not. And can show you basically a slide that I thought I didn't have the time to show. If you can see this here, um, that's basically the idea that if you have a mountain range uplifting in a certain region, the streams will try to um, incise from the sides and integrate the mountain range and drain it basically. And that's what would happen in a non-carbonate mountain range. And there that would actually happen rather quickly. Um, however, in carbonate mountain ranges, if you have a lot of infiltration, this um, integration of streams is much more slowly, simply because um, you would have so much surface water in the streams that you lose to the groundwater, the streams don't have any power to actually incise into the mountain range. And so they might be draped kind of to the sides of the mountain range and you form this internally drained basin in the middle of the mountain range. That is and, interesting. Is that hypothetical or have you um, run landscape evolution models to, um, you know? Yeah, this is a model here. I can show, play this video that shows you exactly this process. This um, is basically a model of a uplifting landscape and we have rivers incising into it. And the black line is a landscape where uh, the river would have um, kind of um, where we, it wouldn't lose um, surface water to the cast water system. And the uh, blue line is a river that loses 75% of its water to the cast water system. And so you can see that this river here in the normal mountain range would integrate much faster and form a normal stream profile. And the one in the landscape with infiltration would take much longer and form a much deeper topography in the end. 
And I think this is what you see on Crete that um, these uplifting carbonate mountain ranges, often the streams don't even have the power to integrate the full mountain range. And you then form um, basically streams on the side and some internal drainage in the middle, just because you, uh, the streams take a very long time to uh, integrate the full thing. It's interesting, thanks. Okay, so we've got another question from Monica. She says, have you considered looking at the roundness of the rocks? Chemical weathering processes may result in rounder class and rounder hill slopes, not just at the apex of the mountain, while mechanically dominated processes, especially with karst systems, will produce more angular blocks and bedrock exposures. Uh, looking at shape changes across the catchment might help you constrain your chemical mechanical balance model. Um, no, that's very interesting. Um, no, I haven't looked into that at all, but um, yeah, it sounds like a very interesting point to, to look at. I have a follow up on the infiltration internal drainage model you are showing here, Richard. Um, mm -hmm. Do you assume some pre existing fractures or fracture network so that the water can infiltrate the shallow rocks really quickly? and create caves in um, deeper rocks? No, that, that model that I've been showing here is much simpler in the sense that it simply assumes uh, that you lose 75% of your water at every, um, at every point here along the stream. That's basically all it does. You lose your water compared to the stream. That's the, the only difference. There's no assumption about um, caves or fractures or how the water gets into the subsurface. Okay, are there any final questions? I'll just make a final comments last question. It's interesting to think about this equilibrium landscape concepts and the the effects that carbonate dissolution or, or karstification have on them. Here you're talking about how diversion of, of water to the subsurface sort of reduces your ability to, to equilibrate. Uh, but I think there's also a other side of the coin where because your carbonates weathering rates are quite insensitive to slope. Um, if you have a situation with low uplift you almost completely lose your ability to equilibrate because you just continually denude until there's nothing left. Like there, it's, it's like yeah. you don't even really have an equilibrium landscape anymore. You just have a landscape yes. that's, that's trying to disappear. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Really interesting work, Richard. And I, mm -hmm. I look forward to seeing where, where this goes in the future. Thanks, thanks for, a lot for, thanks for talking me. to us. Thank you. And hope to see all the rest of you at the, uh, the next talk. Bye.